head of the College of Social Sciences here. Welcome uh, to this evening's uh, debate. Um, it's great to have a full house. Um, uh, just a few um, things uh, before we start. The first thing is to say is that we are live streaming on Facebook, I believe. That's why the camera is here. And with that in mind, uh, when we get to the, the question part, the bit where you get to debate as well, uh, please wait for the microphone so that you can actually be picked up on the live stream. Um, a second thing, and this is for the benefit of the live stream, we're also tweeting today's event. Uh, I believe the hashtag is British Aid. Uh, which we might have stolen from somebody. Um, and uh, on Twitter, if you wish, you can uh, ask me questions that I will try and convey to the panel as well as taking questions from the audience. We'll, we'll see if that works. That's why I've got the iPad open here. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction of all of our panelists and then I'll ask them to speak for no more than five minutes uh, on the subject, which uh, I'll remind you is um, should uh, uh, British aid money uh, only go to democracies. Um, our speakers tonight, and I'll, I'll tell you about them in order, the order that they're going to speak. So we're going to start with Professor Nick Cheeseman to my uh, left, your right. Um, Nick is a Professor of Democracy and International Development here at Birmingham, works in the field of comparative politics and development with a focus on sub <coughs> sub-Saharan Africa and the processes of democratization. And his latest book, uh, How to... Rig How to rig an election <laughs> and get away with it um, uh, is available at all good booksellers. Um, second is Claire uh, Lee. Hi. Uh, Claire is here uh, to uh, my left as you're looking at me. Uh, Claire is Director of International Development Policy Advocate advocacy and campaigns at Save the Children. Uh, she's been director of uh, Save UK's International Development Department since 2016, managing the education, nutrition, health and inclusive policy teams. And before that, she worked at a variety of organizations, including the United uh, Nations Development Program, uh, UNICEF in New York, ODA in London, and uh, the governments of Rwanda and Liberia, where I think you may have interacted with, yes. uh, with Andrew. Um, uh, third up will be Tafal Hussain, um, to my far right as you're looking at me. Uh, Tafal is uh, Deputy Director and Head of Fundraising for Islamic Relief. Uh, Tafal joined Islamic Relief in 2016 and has over 10 years experience in the humanitarian sector, uh, uh, coupled with extensive experience in marketing and campaign uh, management. Um, then uh, it will be Tony Pierce uh, to my right immediately here. Uh, Tony is Oxfam's head of advocacy, uh, managing overseas, managing and overseeing parliamentary and government relations and external affairs, a job that she's been doing since 2016. And before that, you may know that she was president of the National Union of Students from 2013 to 2015. And then finally, um, to my left here, um, the Right hon Honourable Andrew Mitchell, uh, MP, um, MP for Sutton Coldfield, uh, former Secretary of State for International Development, also currently uh, Professor of, uh, what do we call you, Practicing Professor of Development? I forget the title. Anyway, a professor here at the <laughs> University of uh, Birmingham, um, coming in uh, from uh, time to time when his busy parliamentary schedule allows um, engaging with our students in a variety of ways and doing events such as this. So we're very grateful uh, to Andrew for all of that and indeed to all of our panellists for joining us tonight. Um, so with no more ado, I'll pass over to Nick. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, every day when I get to work, I do the same thing as most of you. I open my inbox. My inbox has a little bit of a difference, I hope, to some of yours, which is that every day, I get 20 to 30 messages from civil society and democracy activists around the world showing me evidence of torture and violence and abuse committed on them by authoritarian governments. In 2015 alone, over 100 journalists died in authoritarian contexts. It is estimated that today over 10 million people are living with the scars of torture. So our starting point in this debate must be that we cannot ignore the constant suffering of those living under authoritarian rule. We must also not ignore the reality of the evidence we have about what most people living under authoritarian rule actually want. Authoritarian governments are very good at trying to persuade us 
that their citizens are happy, that they are often willing to trade off other things like development for democracy. <coughs> but the survey evidence we have demonstrates to us that the vast majority of people living under authoritarian rule do not wish to do so. They wish to love, live under democracies. We therefore have an imperative to recognize the suffering and the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of those living in authoritarian states. We must start from a position that we do not want to sustain authoritarian <coughs> rule. Now that, and the fact that the money that we give out as UK aid is of course hard won by taxpayers, means that many of you will think the debate's over, right? We can go home now. We should just be saying no. We must not give money to authoritarian rule, yes. We must only give money to democracies. But there are three good reasons, if you're a Democrat, to actually think about giving money to authoritarian regimes. And so the debate is a bit more complicated than it might first appear. The three principles are the democratizing principle, the humanitarian principle, and the developmental principle. And I'll tell you a little bit about each of these. Let's start with the democratizing principle. If we think that it's so important to promote democracy, that we don't want to give any money at all to authoritarian governments out there, then presumably we want more democracies in the world. And that means that we might want to play a role in bringing democracies about. But of course, we can't really bring democracies about if we don't engage with countries that are not already democracies. We know that our actual engagement around the world, for example, by supporting the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, which might provide loans to authoritarian regimes, through our trade, through our networks, through the arms trade, and etc., is actually helping to sustain authoritarian governments by keeping them the money they need to stay in power. In that case, we may not only want to engage from a point of view of promoting democracy, but to also balance out the negative consequences of other aspects of our engagement. In other words, we might see a priority in engaging in countries to promote civil society, the rule of law, the ability of opposition parties to campaign, a free media. We might think that actually to bring about a more democratic world, we need to provide foreign aid to authoritarian governments to promote those things, because only if we do so will we see authoritarian rule transition to democracy in the future. So this is the democratizing principle. We should give foreign aid to authoritarian regimes when it promotes democracy and moves them in the right direction. Two, the humanitarian principle. It is clearly not the fault of people who are suffering in authoritarian regimes, and by the definition of authoritarian regimes, typically did not actually elect their governments, that they live in such a system. Given that, we might not want to cut them off from financial assistance on the basis of the government that they live under. We might not want, as it were, to compound their oppression. And so in humanitarian contexts, whether we're talking about Ebola, famine, mass starvation, etc., we might think there's an important role for foreign aid, even in the most authoritarian contexts, to show our empathy and compassion for those who are actually suffering most. The final, that's the humanitarian imperative. The final point about why we might want to engage with authoritarian regimes is around development. Many people will tell you that authoritarian regimes are better than democracies at development. That if we want to lift people out of poverty, what we need to do is allow authoritarian governments to make the tough choices that democracies just won't make. And therefore, it's worth sacrificing democracy and some of our principles to get development off the ground. You might also think this is a kind of democratic argument in itself, because democracy often, from the political science point of view, is shown to be stronger where we have a stronger state infrastructure and where we also see uh, higher levels of national wealth. But my argument today, and I think this is where I'll depart from many of the other panelists, or some of the other panelists, is that I don't think we should be giving foreign aid money in this kind of development argument. And the two reasons for that are very simple. One, actually most of the time it turns out to be the case that this kind of developmental support for authoritarians backfires. Think about the leaders we supported in the 70s and 80s who actually turned out in the 90s and 2000s to be the dictators we wanted to remove. But secondly, there is increasing evidence that authoritarian states do not develop or grow faster than their democratic counterparts. There are one or two exceptional cases out there. The average picture is that actually authoritarian states grow less quickly and that they suffer less good governance in a range of areas, including anti-corruption. So, Ladies and gentlemen, I started with the imperative that we must reject <coughs> authoritarian rule and funding for authoritarian rule. I suggested there were three reasons we might compromise on that principle. 
One, to promote long-term democratization. Two, for humanitarian concerns. And three, for development. I rejected the final explanation or principle on the basis that empirically it turns out not to be true. On that basis, I submit to you that UK aid should never be sent to authoritarian states unless it can be shown to promote democracy or is needed to save those in humanitarian distress. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Claire, over to you. Nick, thank you. Um, as might not be surprising given I work for Save the Children, um, I'm going to respectfully disagree with um, Nick's analysis and say, of course we should give British aid to, to non-democracies. And this is for three reasons. So firstly, I think we need to go back to basics and consider why we give aid in the first place. And it's very clear, historically and in the International Development Act and elsewhere, that we give aid primarily and first and foremost to alleviate poverty and suffering wherever it is. Um, this principle is crucial to our aid programme and is already under attack uh, in a variety of fora. We've got a situation over the past 10 years where a lot of British aid is going through other government departments, through the Foreign Office, Department of Trade and Industry. Recently, we heard that some might go through the Ministry of Defence. And that principle of aid to alleviate poverty is already under attack. I think we shouldn't muddy the waters by saying that there's some sort of political agenda with our aid. We're trying to get aid to the people who need it most where they need it most. But aid is finite, and so we do need to make decisions about where we spend it. Um, and I would argue that, assuming we set the bar reasonably high for what constitutes a democracy, the vast majority of poverty in the developing world is actually in non-democratic states. Um, you know, the, 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 the biggest uh, recipients of British aid at the moment are Pakistan, Ethiopia and Nigeria, where we have in turn huge uh, corruption, uh, the, the persecution of minorities in Ethiopia, persecution of women in Pakistan, um, these, these are the countries that, that need our help. They are the countries which uh, 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 have the biggest share of British aid, all non-democracies. Assuming that that's, we accept that that's where the, the biggest need is, um, I think we need to add some nuance into what we're talking about here. I think there's two broad types of uh, 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 non-democratic state where, where aid is, is spent and needed. The first is uh, type A, I would say fragile authoritarian states where there's very weak state capacity. Uh, Democratic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo would be an example of that kind of uh, country. Um, type B would be capacitated authoritarian states, and Rwanda's often mentioned as that type of, of country. Now, I would argue that in, in type A, those fragile authoritarian states, that's actually where the need is greatest for aid. You know, these are, these are people who can't rely on their states to provide basic services. Um, and, uh, and where poverty is often greatest and compounded. And in type B, the capacitated authoritarian states like Rwanda, is actually where aid is often spent most effectively. Um, I mean, or, arguably, authoritarian regimes have lifted more people out of poverty over the past 40 years than, than democracies. Look at miracle countries like Vietnam, the only country, incidentally, to meet all of the MDGs, um, was done under a, a one-party state. I used to work in Rwanda, um, which has transformed the lives of its citizens since 1994. Um, a country where, while I was living there and working in the, um, uh, the government, uh, they introduced universal health care um, for, for its citizens and has recently introduced a universal eye care and dental care for its citizens. I mean, this is a country where, um, you know, there, there, there is a, a, a miracle <coughs> happening in terms of the lives of everyday people. Um, you know, so uh, our aid money is really, really well spent there often. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a question legitimately about how we give aid to these countries, accepting that we need to give aid to these countries. Um, there's such a thing as good aid and there's such a thing as bad aid, and I think actually that's where the discussion and the debate needs to be. Um, good aim, aid aims at transformation. This is what aid's really good at, actually, in investing in systems for the long term. Um, Good aid targets those who would otherwise be forgotten. And actually, let's remember that in both democracies and in authoritarian regimes, there are often minorities, parts of the population, which would be ignored and forgotten. Um, if indeed, there are in our own country. Um, good aid crowds in other sources of finance. Um, and good aid builds the basis for democratic development in the long term. It works with civil society organisations, builds the basis for scrutiny, for holding the government to account, 
Um, it builds through economic development a middle class, a robust middle class who in the long term will demand democracy. <coughs> and it also builds those democratic institutions which will outlive uh, uh, any one regime. Bad aid, on the other hand, uh, undermines state capacity and citizen trust uh, and displaces other sources of finance. It can do that in very, a variety of ways, but it can, for example, um, displace tax, democratic, um, sorry, um, domestic resources, <coughs> Uh, and also private sector investments. So I think what we need to be talking about is how we give aid to non-democratic countries. And let's not forget that that's where the need is and the, our aid is designed to help those in need. Thank you. So thank you, Claire. Um, to fail, we've had good aid, bad aid, development aid, humanitarian aid. Where, where do you stand on this? Yes, no surprise. We have to give aid. Uh, uh, Tefella saying, Islamic Relief UK, uh, we work in some of the most difficult parts of the world, uh, which include Syria, Gaza, and Yemen. Let me share with you a story which I feel encapsulates my issues with tonight's motion. I was in Yemen at the end of 2016, at the beginning of 2017. I met a young child called Salim, who was only three years old. He was at the extreme state of malnutrition. He was dying of starvation. His mother told me that he, she couldn't afford any food. They'd been feeding him for the past year boiling water, boil, bo boiled water with tea. And they, just, they were just reusing that tea, that, that same tea, because they couldn't afford anything. In the past, for the past three, in the past three years, 85,000 children are estimated to have died in Yemen due to starvation. It's not, they, they, weren't, they had no influence on where they were born. They have no influence on the local political situation. They just need food to survive. Like most aid, like most aid organizations, Islamic Relief is driven by the humanitarian principle. We strictly adhere to the principles of impartiality and neutrality. We deliver aid, we strive to help people wherever there is need, simple as that. When it comes to disasters, surely the priority should be to help those that are in need and not look at the local political situation. We can't leave somebody lying under a rubble uh, of a building after an earthquake, surely. People under authoritarian rule may already be living very difficult lives. Denying them aid at times of extreme need is cruel. Politicizing the distribution of aid is totally at odds with the humanitarian imperative and will only lead to greater suffering for the affected population. Now, I appreciate today's uh, mo today's event is about UK aid. But what I've just shared with you, I hope provides an insight into how we have to make difficult, situa difficult decisions, in, in, in situa decisions in very difficult situations. We distribute around £126 million in aid, uh, which is obviously nowhere near the, the UK's £13 billion, but there are obviously veins of similarity there. We must face the facts that the poorest people in the, in, poorest people in the world live in countries that are not democracies at least in the form that we recognize here in the UK. There can be oppressive regimes that lack the systems, the processes, the laws to effectively use aid for economic development. <coughs> However, it is of course naive to think that the governance of any country has no bearing on the lives of its people. It's also equally naive to think that we can be in the business of development without having to make hard choices about where and how we work. We might also question the, the term democratization when looking at states whose population are in desperate need. We have democracies across the world under which people live, that, that, under which people are being persecuted, under which people live where there is a great disparity in, in the distribution of wealth. Therefore, can we confidently say, say, state that um, you know, we should only deliver aid to democracies when people's lives are on the line? What would a development program look like if we adhered to this motion? Would we not respond to crises in Yemen or in Syria? If we recognize the need, where do we start? Where do we stop? There are, of course, ways to effectively deliver aid through checks and balances. Both Mozambique and Zambia are examples where aid was taken away because their checks and balances were not in order. So the idea that UK aid is running away where it cannot be taken away is palpably false. 
So what are our fears about giving aid to authoritarian states? And what can be done to address these concerns? Well, it's, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll uncover some of these, these issues today, but I, I will try and briefly cover them in, in, in the last minute of my, my segment. If I have a minute, Nick. Is you it, do. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, if we fear working in a country where there's a lack, well, do we fear, first of all, the question, right? Do we fear aid in corruption? If we fear working in a country where there is a, demo, where there is a lack of democratic legitimacy, we have the option of delivering aid in a more targeted way. Organizations like SAVE, Oxfam, and Islamic Relief have strengths in, in connections with the local populations. Do we fear that we are stopping civil society from responding to their own issues? As a humanitarian, I am, I am excited with the localization agenda and the potential it brings to strengthen local civil society, society organizations. Working through local institutions will only strengthen their ability to respond. And do we fear that nothing will be done to strengthen the organs of state. This is not something that our agency does, but there are strong examples of UK aid strengthening local governance. One is where HMRC has helped the Nigerian tax authorities to, to try and improve the way that they are collecting the tax. <coughs> Hopefully this, this improvement will, will lessen the, the reliance on aid. I see a few of you smiling. Right? Um, when, a hu when, look, when a fellow human is in need, we must respond and do all that we can to help, no matter their situation or their background. That is being human. So thank you, Tifal. Tony, it would be hum inhuman to withdraw aid. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I would agree. I think the fundamental question here is that is is. I'm going to say it's not the question that's on the table. <laughs> it's what do we think aid is for? And for Oxfam, aid is for ending poverty and suffering wherever we find it. Um, and I think, I think that's the critical thing to hold in our minds. And I think probably all of us would agree on that. But I do think it's important to say that when we talk about giving aid to undemocratic countries, I think it's really critical to understand what we actually mean by that. So... Just over 60% of the UK's aid budget goes through bilateral aid to countries around the world. The rest is spent through multilateral agencies. But only 10% of that just over 60% is given in financial aid directly to government budgets of those countries. So when we talk about giving money to undemocratic countries, the vast majority of the aid that the UK spends might be spent in undemocratic countries or countries that we think could do with uh, you know, becoming more democratic, but that doesn't mean it's being given to the governments that are running those countries. It doesn't mean it's keeping those authoritarian regimes in place. In fact, I would argue that in lots of cases, it's aid and development and lifting people out of poverty and developing a middle class and strengthening the private sector, strengthening local civil society that does challenge and democratise those countries. And I think... For me and for Oxfam, that really is a critical part of the work that we do. The work that Oxfam does isn't just about providing cash and food and water and shelter to people who are most in need. It's about identifying places in which we can support civil society to develop, um, to support local women's groups in DRC to come together and hold their local authorities to account and to give them the protection that an organisation like Oxfam can provide on the ground and the legit leg legitimacy, but also to be able to support them with advocacy at a national or regional or international level to make the case that it is possible in countries that we might not consider to be democratic with a capital D, to have democratic systems, to have systems of civil society that hold local leaders um, <coughs> and local um, systems to account. And actually, a critical part of UK aid is not just about your argument, Nick, that we can help governments move towards democracy, but that we can help citizens move towards democracy. And for me, that is some of the most exciting work that we do in the aid sector. Um, and I think for me, that, that is the other kind of critical question. It's what do we mean when we say, should we only give aid to, undem to democratic countries? Do we mean only countries that have democratic systems like ours or like the United States? I think lots of people would question how democratic some of those countries are. 
does it mean that um, we think if we withdrew our aid from undemocratic countries, that would improve the situation that people were living in in those countries? Would it lift them out of poverty? Would it suddenly lead to the collapse of an authoritarian regime? I think the lessons that we have seen in countries like Zimbabwe, where aid has been removed because people didn't want to shore up authoritarian regimes, is that actually they've just continued, except that their populations have uh, even less support. They've had less support from the international community. And I think that's really critical for me here. That's the big question is, do we think that it is better to uh, live at the moment as a Rohingya Muslim in uh, Myanmar, where Myanmar, it, ha it has elections. It has elections where a quarter of the seats are reserved for members of the military. And if you're a Rohingya Muslim, you don't get a vote. But you know, do we consider that to be better than a country like Rwanda, where there aren't where there, where there aren't elections at all? Do we what do we think is right and wrong here? What do we think the test is for a good enough democracy for us to be giving uh, for us to be giving aid to? Um, and for me, I think um, it's about saying that the aid that we can provide can save people's lives. Uh, it can support. Uh, people to develop and establish democratic systems at a local level, a regional level, and sometimes even a national level. Um, and the reality is, uh, I think, that if we decided we were going to walk away from those countries where people who are often the most in need, living in poverty, uh, living in conflict, if we decided we were going to, as organisations, just leave them behind, um, I think that wouldn't improve their situation. It's not likely to lead to more democratic institutions in those countries. Um, and I think we would be failing, frankly, in our mission as organizations um, and as an internationalist country to try and be trying to make the world a better place. Thank you, Tony. Um, Andrew. Um, like you, I've stood for Parliament and um, attended a number of meetings, a bit like this, with people wanting to hear what I had to say. And I don't know if this has happened to you, but in many of those meetings, people actually wanted to talk about aid. And my recollection is that nobody on the panel of, of any of the parties ever said that aid was a bad idea or that we shouldn't be giving aid. Um, so, we're, we're faced here with a question that suggests that in certain circumstances, maybe we shouldn't be giving aid. You're the person who is credited with turning the Tory party towards the giving of aid and the generous giving of aid. Where do you stand on this? Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, uh, what a fascinating topic. Um, and I agree with quite a lot of what every other member of the panel has said. Um, so let me try and phrase it in a slightly different way. I mean, first of all, this is not one of the most difficult aspects of development aid. I mean, the issue of authoritarian regimes. That there are big issues about which regimes you, or, or which countries we support, um, and I changed the bilateral program fairly significantly. But, but uh, you know, there were, mu there were much more complex, difficult public-facing issues to do with, for example, the work we did on family planning or supporting... Um, in the very poor world, women's rights to choose whether and when they have children and so forth. They were much more uh, uh, difficult and likely to bring us into trouble with the Daily Mail, for example. Um, and we did a lot of work on that, and actually it didn't. But, but I think I can give you a fairly simple answer to this issue. But I want to make it clear that the issue of aid to um, authoritarian regimes is not a big part of the picture. The big part of the picture is how do you stop uh, conflict, which condemns people to be poor? How do you help uh, get girls into school? How do you ensure that uh, there's a prosperity agenda? Because the way in which poor people lift themselves out of poverty in poor countries and in rich countries is by being economically active. That's the first and, and easiest way to lift yourself out of poverty. So we need to make sure those opportunities are, are presented. Now, on, on the subject before us, let's be clear, the aim of British development policy is to lift people out of poverty, it's to tackle the extremes of poverty. And my party made two commitments. One was to the point seven. But equally important, and more important actually in terms of aid effectiveness, was the rules. 
Um, someone said earlier that aid is being delivered through other departments. That doesn't matter. What matters is that the aid is delivered effectively and that, it's, and that the aid that is spent through other departments is within the ODA rules, the, 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 uh, that that aid money is dackable. So there may be an effectiveness argument, but there's not a structural argument there. Now, now, when it comes to giving aid to authoritarian regimes, if we don't like the regime, of course, we don't give the regime any aid. So, so we are focused on poverty elimination, doing our best uh, in, in that respect. And where we don't like the regime, because it's authoritarian or because it's corrupt, we go round it. And that's a very cardinal principle of all of this. Direct budget support, which is giving money to regimes, is the best way of doing development. It's the best way of doing development because, of course, if you're putting money into schools and schooling through the regime of a country, then they own it. They own the, the, the structures and they're building up statecraft by being able to administer an education system. So, of course, ideally, you go through the regime and you do give money to, through governments and through government treasuries. But, but the reason why we've drawn back from doing so much of that is we have to be able to maintain taxpayer support and we have to be sure that the money is being well spent. And, and that's why you know, I used to repeat endlessly that for every hard-earned British taxpayer's pound we spend, we must be able to see 100 pence of delivery on the ground. And often if you've got a regime that is corrupt, uh, then you can't do that. You can't be sure how the money is being spent. And, the, and therefore you don't go through the regime. Now, where the rubber hits the road, I'll give you a specific example. In about 2008, uh, following an Ethiopian uh, election, the regime of Mela Zanawi started shooting. They shot 14 students on the streets of Addis Ababa. And uh, Ethiopia then was an aid darling because a British pound spent in Ethiopia, the Ethiopians, and indeed the Rwandans, really do deliver. You know, you, when they say how they will spend our money and we agree the terms, they stick to it absolutely. So we were faced with a dilemma in Ethiopia, which was the regime is behaving appallingly. Um, do we take money away? What do we do about budget support? Because be in no doubt, if you take money away from a regime in that circumstance, it's not the regime leaders who you are punishing. It's the people, it's the, the girls who won't then go to school or the, or the children who won't be fed. So, so uh, you know, that's the key point uh, in dealing with a regime. You've got to understand that you're trying, the relations that Britain has, British development has, is with the people of a country. It's not necessarily with the elite or the government. It's with the people. That is the absolutely critical thing. And, you know, in the DRC, where uh, it wasn't only not working through the government, but some of the institutions we were trying to work with in the DRC, where there is immense need and immense poverty, I did consider giving the entire funding program by the British government to the IRC, to a charity, whom I thought would be better able to pursue some of the objectives which, which uh, you just mentioned, actually, um, would be much better to get the IRC to, to do that. So it's all about making sure that the British pound that is spent in this way is spent to the maximum effect in accordance with the Act, which is the alleviation of poverty. And um, uh, the other thing is that you must be absolutely clear about transparency and openness. I don't really talk about democracy so much now. I talk about accountability. It's the most important thing is that those who have the privilege and responsibility of leadership in these countries, that they should be able to be held to account. And therefore, putting money into trying to make sure they are held to account is enormously valuable. Just final point. On, on Zimbabwe, we did give money to Zimbabwe. But uh, we did, I think, in, in a careful way. So, for example, when cholera broke out, uh, notwithstanding all the difficulties with Zimbabwe, which are even worse today, actually, in some ways, um, we, we did spend our taxpayers' money carefully to try and head off that cholera outbreak, and we did it quite successfully, and I thought that justified that expenditure. And, and the other thing is that uh, we gave some money to make sure that the education system continued in Zimbabwe in the bad times. Why? Because Zimbabwe had the best education system in Africa at one, at one point. The system was under great strain, and we wanted to make sure that the embers weren't put out and that we, we could make sure that they, they were the basics of education continued till the better times come and that a generation don't, lead, don't lose out on an education. So those are the sort of factors which I think are much more important uh, rather than whether the regime is authoritarian or not because, as I say, our relationship isn't really with the regime, it's with the poor in these countries which we are seeking to assist. Okay, I think at this point I'd like to open it up to the audience to ask questions or indeed to make comments. So do we have a 
microphone. <coughs> yes, so the microphone over there, microphone over there. So who'd like to kick us off? So yes, there's a gentleman here. Thank you. Um, my name is Muhammad Ali, and I come from a uh, continent of Africa, more specifically Horn of Africa, and a country which has seen more famine than any other country, a civil war, a um, huge amount of terrorism, and that country is Somalia. And, but I most, mostly come from, from the north, which is called Somaliland. And as per the st statistics of UK aid, and Somalia has been the fourth and most that the British has given aid to, more specifically 282 million. And my question is to the panel who are against the motion, do you think you're underestimating the grassroots, I mean, the people in which uh, the aid's supposed to go to? Most of this aid, and I have worked for local NGOs there and international NGOs there, and most of the money that, that's been given is not going directly to the people. 25%, I would say, might go there. The rest, 75%, could be going into administration costs and f flights, workshops, seminars, and uh, I'm not saying that uh, all of that has gone to waste, but my question is, is it, is, it, is it worth it that we give money to authoritarian regimes and the people who are supposed to be benefiting from these benefits, uh, from this aid, is not receiving them? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'll take one more question now. There's one right there next to you, Lizzie. Um, I th uh, it's very interesting to have this debate but I, I looked at who actually got uh, aid from the UK in 2017, the last published figures. And these are the top 10 countries in order. Pakistan, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Syria, Somalia, Afghanistan, the Yemen, Bangladesh, Southern Sudan, and Tanzania. Out of those, very few, perhaps even one or two, would actually be called democracies. Most of those countries, it, their regime is top-down, not bottom-up. And Andrew mentions Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the third largest recipient of UK aid. How did that regime recently, literally only in the last year, change? It changed at the top, not from the bottom. Unfortunately, I think too much of our money is simply given to those governments. It is not given for humanitarian crises. I exclude refugee camps and things like that. It all too often goes, and the example I'll give is Pakistan. Pakistan used to get, I'm not sure if it still gets, money from the UK for its education sector. A colleague of mine has worked in Pakistan for many years. He's never been to a school which is funded by the UK taxpayer where there's even a teacher in the room. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I, I take it two objections to aid there, one on the grounds of uh, money not getting through and another on the grounds of the countries that the aid is given to. Andrew, do you want to respond yes. to that? Yes, I mean, uh, let, let, let's be clear, that's absolutely not true, what you said about Pakistan, <laughs> with, with the greatest of respect. I mean, India has been the biggest recipient of British aid until the first year of the coalition. Since the Second World War, India had been the biggest recipient of aid. <coughs> Um, and now it's changed. It was then Ethiopia in, in 11 and in 12. It was Pakistan. It's been Pakistan ever since. Pakistan, the work we do on schooling there is absolutely brilliant work. And what we're doing, we, we've, we've had the brilliant uh, Sir Michael Barber, who, who was, ran, ran Blair's delivery unit. Uh, he's worked very closely, particularly with the government of the Punjab. And, you know, the statistics, I haven't got them at my fingertips, but you know, Britain is basically assisting the Pakistani uh, <coughs> education system to develop and educate, and to educate girls and to make sure that, that it's a much better system of administration and so forth. And uh, uh, most of the money, actually, that funds the Pakistani education system is Pakistani money. The, 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 the problem with doing, doing uh, this work in Pakistan is that, is that too often there's a danger that, that uh, 
taxes not paid in sufficient amounts by the wealthy in Pakistan. That's the big objection on Pakistan. It's not that the money is not spent effectively. And the idea, you tell your friend, if he says he's never seen a British uh, a teacher in a British paid school, you tell him either he's not telling you the truth and, or else, uh, or else uh, he needs to widen the ambit of his work on Pakistan. Um, well, well, can we have his name? What's his name? Well, you tell me afterwards, but it's completely untrue. What, what I, I promise you. I mean, I've, I've been in schools in Pakistan which belie that what, what you said. Now, now on, on Somalia and Somalia, of course, Somaliland, which I think, are you from Somaliland? Yes. I mean, Somaliland actually is an operating democracy, and, and the big issue about Somaliland is whether it can be independent. That's the the big issue, and, and get away from the rest of the Somalian uh, Federation. But, but, and actually also, let, let's, there's another truth about this, which is that the, um, in uh, 2012, the, the budget of Somaliland was about 100 million, of which Britain was providing about 30 million, a lot of it for security work. Um, that was the budget. The, the amount of remittances that were received in Somaliland was nearly half a billion, uh, uh, 500 million pounds. So, so, so the, the entrepreneurialism and the effectiveness of, of Somaliland is not, I suspect, the issue. Now, in terms of money getting through to the front line in Somalia, uh, there are issues of uh, aid and British taxpayer-funded um, uh, goods being stolen. And there are very uh, big um, penalties in the British legal system if terrorists are able to take over British-funded uh, food and so forth. Uh, including, I was informed on one occasion, the possibility of the Secretary of State going to prison. So, so there, there are very serious safeguards to try and ensure that doesn't happen. And of course there are administrative costs in conflict areas. Of course there are uh, heavily administrative uh, costs because people have to be defended and properly looked after and often flown in and out for a long period of time. Many of the NGOs and people working in Somalia were having to live in Nairobi. So, so there are those costs. But I think the commitment I can give you I believe it is still true, it certainly was true, is that we are careful to ensure that those costs are kept to a minimum so that the hard-earned taxpayers' money that we allocate to Somalia, quite rightly, because it's doing very good work, it's pursuing four objectives there and doing it, I think, quite well, um, that money that, that is maximised and the money spent on administration is minimised. Tony, how does Oxfam avoid spending its aid on flights and uh, conferences and, and uh, the other things that were mentioned there? Well, I paid for my own taxi to come here tonight. That's the start. Um, uh, I, I spent some time in Somaliland, actually, with Oxfam. Um, and the thing that I um, was astonished by was some Somali civil society in Somaliland, and actually the Somali civil society that is based in, in Somalia um, and around Mogadishu, um, and the, 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 as you say, the entrepreneurialism of those groups, but also the, the complete commitment to delivering for Somali people, particularly in, in the context of the drought. And I... I think the really important thing is that we all signed up as aid agencies and donors a few years ago to something called the Grand Bargain, which is that we will commit to a certain proportion of aid being spent through local organisations and local um, partner groups and communities um, because we have a responsibility, not just DFID and not just governments, but aid organisations like Oxfam and Save the Children and Islamic Relief, I would argue, to make sure that we are investing in those local organisations, not just swooping in and delivering. And I think that is um, that is a shift that the sector is committed to. Um, and that it's kind of, it's not really the case that these big aid agencies just kind of go in and deliver everything and kind of turn up with big bags of food because that isn't where the strength and actually the vast majority of people and resources and commitment working in development it's not coming from us it's coming from people in those countries themselves the the thing i would just say about the countries that we give the most aid to is is it, it is really important to distinguish between 
money that is spent in those countries and money that is given to the governments of those countries. And I would suggest going back and looking at those because um, lots of those countries do appear in that top list, but it's a much smaller amount of money that's given directly to those governments, partly for that reason, is that, you know, I, I believe that DFID is committed to helping the poorest people in those countries. And the reality is that a, a, a a vast number of the world's poorest people live in middle-income countries and lower-middle-income countries. And that's where they are. And if we are committed to helping lift people out of poverty, that's where we need to go. OK, let's go back to the audience for a couple more questions. Who, who else would like to contribute? Uh, OK, one at the front here. Uh, hi, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I just wanna, my name's Rob. I just want to say thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's been really uh, interesting to hear from all of you. Um, so, yeah, just thank you for coming in. Um, I just want to pick up on the point, um, I can't remember who made it, about um, the idea that kind of um, going... I agree with uh, Andrew that the idea that you should go uh, through uh, states where possible in order to deliver aid, um, is the which produces the maximum benefit. I agree with that. But I just... Um, I think... From my experience, I um, have worked with charities in uh, Kosovo in Southeast Europe, um, and that's my specialist interest area. And in that case, um, kind of, and you suggested that if you can't go through the, um, you can't go through the re regime or state, then you should go around it directly into the people. Is, from my understanding, what you were inferring. Um, and I just want to kind of, from my experience, issue a word of caution that it, um, just as a comment really, that maybe um, in that instance, that often. Um, Corruption isn't just, it can be grand corruption, state capture and other things, but also can be embedded in culture, um, which I think is a real uh, word of warning in, um, um, in AIDS, which is something that is uh, context specific and depends on kind of context. Um, and so I, I think I agree we, I, I agree we um, can't ignore um, aid and we should give aid um, to those countries, but I think there needs to be more scrutiny um, in maybe delivering the aid and how it affects and how it is not necessarily corruption and the issue of kind of the black hole of aid money isn't just in states but in the population itself sometimes. Um, I, just a comment, so if you want to come back with me, come, ba come back to me with that, please feel free. Thank you. Um, can we take uh, one more <coughs> question before I go back to the panel? Mm -hmm. Yes, right at the back. <coughs> So it's, it's like more a comment also, it's like it's, it's just answering the question, should aid only go to democracies? What happened, they, they got, not democracies, the countries that are not democracies also need aid. So what happened if a normal, if, I don't know, British for example, British don't give aid for this country, where they ask China is the most, is the most common country. And now it's common happening, that is a thing that is appearing in international relations, is the call that book diplomacy is that China helping these countries is like China is buying Africa, is that they say. So what happened with, I don't know if you, you, you have you heard about that? What do you think? Stop. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's go to that one first. Uh, Nick, China is buying Africa? Um, I wouldn't frame it quite like that myself. Um, <laughs> I mean, of course, one of the reasons why China is very successful in Africa is that it's seen to have offered by a lot of African leaders and African citizens a fairer deal, which is that it hasn't attached political conditionality, so it's not sticking to my democracy principle, um, but also that it's framed itself around not being a colonial power and therefore created distance rhetorically and symbolically between itself and the West. I think one thing we're starting to see, and I would predict over this year we'll see more, is a backlash against China because actually trade imbalances and the relationship as it is, is actually much more looking like a neo-colonial relationship than a simple balanced partnership one. And I think the tensions in that relationship will become harder and harder to sustain, and it will st we'll start to see backlash. Um, but I, what I wanted to sort of come back on in general is the question about, yes, we see some of the world's poorest people in authoritarian states. And I guess we agree an awful lot on the panel about the humanitarian imperative, the development imperative, et cetera. I think what I want to see is a more critical attitude towards why are the poorest people in the authoritarian states, right? It's not an accident. It's because they're authoritarian states. And if we do not get to the bottom of that, we are putting a plaster on the problem. 
The problem in many of the countries is that the lack of accountability, and here me and Andrew completely agree, the lack of accountability is one of the things that prevents citizens from making demands on the government. It's one of the reasons why people are starving. Some of the famines we know are not simply about an absence of food. They are an absence of political rights to demand the provision of food where there is adequate food available. So I'm not suggesting for a minute that we should ever leave people who are starving to starve. But I am saying that if we do not think about the long-term challenge of making governments more accountable so that it's not the case that all the poor people live in the authoritarian regimes, we are failing in our duty both to provide effective sustainable aid, but also to help those people not live under authoritarian regimes that abuse their human rights. Thank you. And um, to fail, um, Rob's question was about um, whether there is corruption when you send aid not through the state but through direct channels, if I understood it correctly. Does Islamic Relief experience corruption when it seeks to deliver aid directly? How do you, how do you fight against that? By having strong systems in place, by having checks and balances, like I, like I mentioned earlier. Look, in any partnership between humans, there you know it's an imperfect relationship. It, you know, it's the human factor. There is always you know, I trust. Uh, I, I trust you, but I don't trust the devil inside you. Uh, and so, therefore, I think it's important to have those robust systems in place to ensure that uh, risks of um, of corruption are minimised. Um, we, work, we, we work obviously with our partners on the ground and we do regular checks and balances. We have, uh, we have this competitive nature between us and, uh, and our, uh, you know, our, our worldwide secretariat where we also we check on if they're doing their job properly. They also have their, their own team, which is the monitoring and evaluation team, which goes out and does you know, root and branch analysis <laughs> reviews of projects to ensure that you can, you can, you can have the, the best systems in place. Sometimes, if if a person wants to, wants to um, wants to be dodgy, um, you know they, they 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 will be they will try. But it's it's important to have the right systems in place to try and minimise the risk of of corruption happening. And we obviously we try our best. We have we have a strong accountability framework, and we have strong systems in place. Okay, uh, let's go back to the audience. Um, Danielle, do you have a question? I sent it via Twitter. So you bet. So no, you. It's a question, but without it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, in various presentations, there was the point raised that states can move in and out of authoritarianism and in and out of democratic practices. So, I'm wondering what the panelists think should be red lines, so points at which the UK government should switch from providing funding to national representatives, national governments, and instead to other forms of, of, of assistance. Okay, and would take another question as well, one immediately behind. Uh, thank you. Um, my uh, observation is that the discussions and the presentations have been, pri sorry, can you hear this? M have been primarily a historical. It's like you could have picked this up for debate up and put it in eight, 10 years ago, how the same kind of questions got similar answers, or in 10 years' time got the same kind of answers. And I'm just interested to um, ask the panel about what their reflections might be on the fact that words such as um, obligations, historic obligations, haven't been used, um, such as no one's mentioned any words such as solidarity. There's no sense of conversation or discussion about movement. And I'm just interested that that will be quite an odd discussion to have going back historically with the people that have been involved in leading the development of the aid movement in the past, in the 60s and 70s. And I'm just interested to know, I suppose the sharp question is, if we can't escape this, uh, it's what is essentially a charity paradigm, does it really make any difference where we put the aid? Okay, two great questions there. Um, Claire, um, what would your red lines be? Red lines, well, I mean, I was thinking about, I mean, thinking about, uh, where we might worry if a state is, is deteriorating somehow, moving into a situation of authoritarianism. I mean, there's the question around corruption, and I think it's clear to everyone here that corruption exists both in democratic or more democratic states and in less democratic states. So in some ways, we wouldn't necessarily see an increase in corruption in a state moving towards authoritarianism. In fact, Rwanda, for example, has some of the lowest levels of corruption in the developing world. So. You know, that in some ways is, is, is not the issue. I think uh, 
Where we would worry is if the effectiveness of age was being compromised by political changes. Um, we ensure the effectiveness of age when working with the government through transparency, through scrutiny, through building strong systems. Um, if those started to be compromised and undermined, um, I think that's when we would think about whether that is still the right delivery route for, for aid. As Andrew said, and as I strongly believe through my own experiences in, in working in Rwanda and, and Liberia and elsewhere, aid delivered through the government rather than bypassing the government is the best way to deliver effective aid. It's the most sustainable, long-term way to build the capacity of a country to stand on its own two feet. Um, but obviously, if that ceases to be uh, beneficial to the people we're trying to reach, that's when you have to reconsider, and that's obviously what Andrew did as Secretary of State um, with, with a number of countries. So on that, Andrew, were there have there been states where you have where the red line was crossed, and what were the actions that you took? Well, the the um, I mean, the, 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 I stopped the program in Burundi, which is probably the most controversial program I stopped because thirty percent of the cost of the program was administrative, and it was a very small program. And Burundi is not a former British uh, area of British interest or historic connection. Um, and so in that particular program, I decided that we should, we should stop it. But on, on um, direct budget support, the, which we do much, much less of now, it's, it's whether you've got a clear sight of how the money is being spent. Because corruption is the, is the cancer in development. Because it doesn't only mean that our hard-earned money is being stolen and removed. It also uh, denies the people we're trying to help the benefits we want them to have, but it also um, uh, poisons the well of public support for development. I and mean, there is nothing, I walk into the pub in Sutton Coalfield from time to time, and if there's been some allegation of corruption, someone will come up and put their hand on my shoulder and say, Ear, yeah, what about uh, that story last week I read on our money being stolen? So corruption is absolutely uh, poisonous to development, and you have to have. Um, a, a complete red line which says where corruption happens uh, you, you just have to stop the programme and find another way of doing it but, but it's complicated I, mean, I remember going to Kenya and to get back uh, some about £80 million of our money had been stolen uh, for going through the education system there and I went to tell Kenyatta who was then the finance minister that I wanted the money repaid because parliament would expect that you know, this should not be allowed to happen. And I, I delivered my colonialist lecture to Kenyatta, and he very quietly said to me at the end, you do realise, don't you, that the, re the reason you know about this is because we found out the money had been taken and we told you. So, you know, it's, a complica it's very complicated. But basically, on budget support, it's all about effectiveness. We do much less now. Not, I think there is a bit of an ideological uh, dislike of budget support amongst, amongst some in the industry, and that's fair enough. But, but for me, it was, it was simply, is it the best way, the best use of taxpayers' money to achieve the objectives? And can, I, can I just say, on the point about charity, um, I don't really... I mean, we, when you talk about the 60s and 70s, I, I don't think... I was saying this in a lecture earlier today here, that, that I don't really think modern development started until the Berlin Wall came down. Because, you know, in the 60s and 70s, which you were talking about, aid was given to Mobutu to keep the DRC in the Western area of influence and not in the Soviet area of influence. So I think that the, the, the modern aims <coughs> of development, set out by Tony Blair so clearly and built on by the Tories, I would argue, um, you know, very clear what the aims of development are. But, but in those days, in the 60s and 70s, you know, it was... To, to, it might be a dictator, but we wanted him to be our dictator. It was as simple as that. So we've got two really interesting lines of discussion going here, but Nick, I know you want to say something. I'm hoping it's going to be a red line that was crossed and nothing was done about it. Well, two quick thoughts there. I mean, I think Andrew's right that things have changed, but let's not pretend that Pakistan is not one of the main aid recipients for the US and UK because of, you know, it's just about need, right? It's because they're an ally in the war on terror. Right? So have things radically changed? Does the US change its funding simply on need? Or is it also about, you know, why is the US so supportive of Ethiopia? Why are we so supportive of Ethiopia? Yes, it's partly about need. It's also geostrategic interest. They are our proxy in Somalia. Right? Let's not take the politics out of aid and pretend this is simply about a need calculation. It's not. 
And I think we, you know, people feel if we try and pull the wool over their eyes and pretend this is all completely altruistic. That doesn't mean that aid's not great. It doesn't mean aid's not important. But there are clearly governments that we have military relationships with and aid relationships with, which are not solely driven by a concern for the interests of the people. But I also just wanted to say, and it ties in with that, it's, it's very disturbing to me, I think, and quite cynical that you know, we've had two people speak about red lines. Not one of them has talked about the fact that some of the governments we fund assassinate their own citizens. They've talked about corruption. The aid agency should not be number one concerned about corruption, right? Corruption's bad, sure. I completely agree around you. We have to be careful. We don't want to undermine support for aid. It's critical that the aid budget remains high. That is, going back to your previous comment, part of our obligation for things that have happened in the past as well. But we also have to be aware that there were worse things in the world than corruption, right? Governments that assassinate opposition candidates, human rights violations, people who are put in jail for 20, 30 years without charges. All of these things are documented by organizations like Amnesty International. We know they happen. And actually, some of those governments have been praised today by people on the panel. And I do think we have to say the red line should be massive human rights violations by governments, right? It shouldn't just be corruption. We shouldn't make that all that we talk about, but just to talk about corruption is to ignore the politics of aid. I think, I think Nick is missing a, a very important point in, in what he said. And, and, and it is this, the relationship we have is not with governments. It is with the people we are trying to help in these countries. And I'll come back to Pakistan at the moment, but I suspect you were talking about Rwanda. Was it Rwanda you were thinking of in one of the... There were a few. <laughs> Vietnam, <laughs> Vietnam has also been mentioned as a shining light. Wait, which one? Vietnam has also been mentioned as a shining light that is condemned by human rights organisations. Well, we stopped giving, we stopped aid to Vietnam. Uh, it was start, we started winding it down in 2010, almost immediately. Uh, but that was not for that reason. It was because Vietnam has been soaring out of poverty. Um, so, so I mean, it's just you, just because a country assassinates uh, someone, uh, that is not a reason to punish the citizens of that country by cutting off our support. Um, and and when you say about Pakistan. Of course, historic interest plays a part. That's why we were not in Burundi and why we are in, in uh, Sudan. Um, we're, we're, we're very heavily engaged in, in Sudan. So, of course, historic, uh, uh, histor hi historic events play a part in the decision you make in which countries to have bilateral programs for. But Pakistan is now at the top of the list. Certainly because we have strategic interests in Pakistan, but also because on a whole series of humanitarian uh, ways, Pakistan justifies Britain's strong engagement. And actually, you know, what Britain is doing in Pakistan is trying to help Pakistan lift itself out of poverty. So the work on education, for example, will make a real difference to the future of Pakistan. Okay, now we are five minutes away from the end. I do, I do want to give a chance for each of the uh, panelists to, to wind up and say one more thing, but I'm going to take a couple more questions. We've had very few women speaking, so two, two women had their hands up here, so both of you, please. Hi. i um, just like to um, make a point about what you said, Andrew, um, that the UK doesn't want to get involved in other governments. Um, Jeremy Hunt get involved with other governments' issues. So I was wondering what um, Jeremy Hunt's policy was this week when he's been <laughs> tweeting quite vigorously about the governments in Venezuela. Is that our new foreign policy? Okay, we'll let, we'll let Andrew pick that up in his um, remarks at the end. And, and uh, okay, um, my question is regarding, um, yes, we all recognize that foreign aid is positive. It has uh, promoted development. But at the same time, it has been tolerating exactly uh, repressive acts of authoritarian regimes um, in their desire to persuade authoritarian regimes into democracy. And so can we say that, yes, it is promoting development, but at the same time, it is reinforcing authoritarianism? OK. So um, Tufal, <coughs> you were one of the strongest advocates for um, uh, aid as a, as a humanitarian act, um, wh what do you say to the charge that it is reinforcing, in some cases, uh, author authoritarian regimes? Look, I think that you, you have to, for me, it just goes that back to the humanitarian imperative. It, it's about helping people in need. If there is someone that is starving, if there is someone that is desperately in need, we, we have to take out all the other, for me, all the, all the other sort of potential ramifications and 
you, you, of course, you do, you do your best to try and minimize um, the risk of aid going into, ha going into the wrong hands or being utilized in the wrong way to, to, to prop up a government or whatever. Um, and it can be argued, of course, if you, if you, are, if you are sort of going into, an, uh, into a country and supporting education, whatever you are, in effect, supporting that regime in an indirect way. Uh, however, for me, I think that when it comes to somebody suffering, it's very simple. If somebody's suffering, if somebody's dying, if somebody's starving, we have to do all that we can to help them, despite what their situation is. It's as simple as that for me. Um, and, and, you know, we have, we have organizations, we have NGOs that are able to, to, to work, uh, uh, you know, rather than sort of aid going bilaterally, we can work through local organizations to try and minimize that, to try and minimize that risk of, of aid going into the hands of, of governments. Um, but for me, yeah, simple really, I'm, and I'm a simple man. If somebody's in need, we need to help them. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go out for more questions now. We're, we're going to have um, drinks immediately outside after the event. Uh, all of the panel speakers will be staying around at least for a little while for you to ask questions directly to them. But I'm just going to go around each of the panelists now and give them one last chance to answer a question that has not been answered or in the spirit of one of the questioners, I think, one of the panelists said um, they didn't really agree with the question that was set and tried to answer a different one. Uh, don't do that in exams, but <laughs> otherwise it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. So Claire, um, winding up comment from you. Yeah, I mean, I would go back to the uh, original point I made about the, uh, the keeping in mind the purpose of aid and British aid, which is to help alleviate the suffering of people living in poverty around the world. The way that we do that is up for grabs, but that poverty is largely in countries which do not live up to the democratic standards of the United Kingdom, such as they are. Um, and that's no reason to doubly punish people living in those states for having terrible governments and then not getting the aid that's going to help them uh, improve their lives. We can talk about how to deliver aid in those states, but let's not abandon those people. Nick, are we punishing people? I don't think it's about that, but we have limited aid and we have a certain number of governments we can engage with. So my call was to try and engage more with the democratic ones than the not. I think it's important to keep in mind this distinction between giving money to governments and giving money to civil society bodies, etc., outside of governments, which can, of course, change the balance of power and over time affect more democracy. But I guess my sort of thing that I would like people to keep in mind is that we do need to learn the lessons of history. You know, 30 years ago, we thought Mugabe was great, we gave him awards, then we realized that supporting an authoritarian government delivering on development didn't work. 20 years ago, we did the same to Museveni. Then we decided Museveni didn't work. Today, we are doing the same with Kagame. There's a pretty good chance in 10 years' time we'll be talking about Kagame as the dictator we need to remove, just as we are today talking about Museveni, and we were a few years ago talking about Mugabe. If we do not learn the lessons of history and we think we can do development and aid without understanding politics, we will repeat the mistakes, and these countries will remain authoritarian, and they will remain poor. Tony. Yeah, I mean, I think... I I think your question, sorry, I didn't get your name, about um, whether, whether this is about charity or not is is really important in this because I, I don't think that aid is just about alleviating suffering. I think it's about changing the conditions that create suffering, partly. It's partly about dealing with what's right in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also about trying to create a world in which those conditions don't exist and... I suppose I think that if we withdrew from countries in which we are supporting civil society to build and rebuild, and particularly supporting women's voices to be heard, particularly in conflict situations, we would be we would be doing the opposite of supporting um, uh, democ democracy, whether that's with a capital D or otherwise. And and I also think that um, you know. Ultimately, the question is, if we, if we walk away, what difference does it make? Will those countries suddenly stop being authoritarian um, because we're no longer giving aid money either to them or their citizens, or will it continue or get worse? And I think the answer to that question is, very rarely do things change because we withdraw aid support from a country. And 
I, you know, I think that it has to be based on not just what do we think in theory is the right thing to do, but also practically what difference will it make. Okay, and to fail? I think one of the core values for any good human is compassion. Uh, I like using analogies, so uh, I'll use one now. Um, you, you, you leave today, you're, you're driving home, for those of you that don't live on campus, uh, and you end up in a neighborhood which is uh, a neighborhood which um, has councillors that are really, you know, corrupt, uh, uh, dodgy, and they've been voted in time and time again, year on year, by, by, the, by the local people. Uh, and you're of the opinion that, you know, these guys, they vote for this councillor. The, 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 the situation these guys are in is because of that councillor. But as you're driving through, and uh, you, you see a child that's on the floor, that's, that's clearly in trouble. Uh, and is freezing, would you leave that child alone? That's it. Okay, and Andrew, as our honorary professor, I'll give you the last word. Thanks very much. Well, I th I just took, let me jog just through a couple of the last questions. First of all, on Venezuela, um, we, we don't have any development programs at all in South America now. And I've been a critic of the quite a chunk of government foreign policy, in particular Yemen and Saudi Arabia, where at long last, having spent two years totally ineffectively trying to change the government policy, it's now changed because the, the space opened up by the Americans, actually, for change on Yemen. But uh, on, um, on Venezuela, I don't think I would be a critic of what Jeremy Hunt has said uh, so far, anyway, although I haven't seen what he said today at the meeting in, in Romania. Um, I think my, I have a bigger difference with Nick, I think, than I realised uh, uh, from our opening. Uh, but, I mean, consider who are... This, this is why I think that he's wrong. Who are the biggest eliminators of poverty over the last 20 years? The biggest eliminators of poverty are the authoritarian Chinese and the democratic Indians. And, and so that's why I think that the, the idea of taking an absolutist position on authoritarian states is, is, is not correct. And I've set out why, because of the relationship with, with the people there. Um, on Rwanda, and uh, Mugabe, of course, when he came to power, was, you know, <coughs> there were quite good seeds of democracy in Zimbabwe, and they they haven't quite been snuffed out uh, since. Um, so, um, and, and Zimbabwe is a, a special case anyway. But on Rwanda, which is in development, darling, enormously successful, Britain has a very close relationship, built partly on guilt, actually, because we did nothing in the genocide and just sat around and the UN was totally ineffective. Everyone looked the other way while nearly a million people were murdered in 90 days. But, but. Um, you know, our relationship does enable us to have a very strong uh, um, position with them. We talk consistently to the Rwandans about the importance of opening up political space and media space. They have just released all, their, all the so-called political prisoners there, um, and they are opening up the, the, the media space because they are separating, ruling, running the media from the government, and we'll see whether it works or not. But it, you know, it does give us a chance to have a dialogue. And the final point I, I would make is I brought, I hope you don't mind, I brought a copy for everyone of uh, this project we ran in Rwanda, which Danielle and I were heavily involved in. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it is a technically a conservative party project, but don't let that put you off because it's it's also <laughs> it's also about the interface between politics and development. And the reason I hope very much people will take it away is I do believe, and this is my cardinal point, that that we as a generation uniquely have the power to do something about these appalling discrepancies of opportunity and wealth which disfigure our world, partly because of, of, of uh, modern technology, partly because of globalisation. So we have that power in our generation. And I hope that particularly some of the younger people who have come here today, if they look at this project, they may feel inspired to make a contribution because brilliant students of Birmingham have the ability to make that contribution and to be part of what I think will be a huge generational shift and Britain is a world leader on development. I always used to say that America was a military superpower and Britain was a development uh, superpower. And, and, you know, we still are. And it's the, it's the British academic thought that drives the ideas. It's DFID as, a, as, a, a, as by far the strongest development agency in, in the world. It's the uh, British ideas activity and Britain putting its money where its mouth is too, which is leading the world on development. And academic institutions and organisations like Birmingham University make a big contribution to that.
Okay, well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you to all of our panellists for what I think has been a fascinating evening. I'm, I'm sorry I've allowed us to go a few minutes over, um, but I'd like to ask everybody to thank uh, all of our panel for entertaining us. Thank you. And with the exception of those watching us on Facebook, uh, you're welcome to come outside and, uh, and have a drink and ask those questions that you didn't get a chance to ask uh, already.